Welcome once again. In this video, we're going to answer the question, which Bible canon does God approve? Now, what I'm going to say here is not going to be very easy for a lot of people to digest. So if you just want just the milk, okay, I mean, if you're just a babe in Christ, if you're just a baby in the faith, um, this is probably not for you because we are going to get into some real meat here. I'm talking about a real good barbecue steak. Some of the principles and concepts I'm going to touch on here is not very easy for some people to digest. So I encourage you right off the bat, hear me out before leaving a comment, before drawing a conclusion or making a judgment about me or anything I say, hear me out. It says in the scriptures that those people who answer a matter, if you come to a conclusion before you hear the entire matter, it is foolishness. It is a folly to you. So I encourage you to listen to everything that I'm about to present. First of all, I want to define what a Bible canon is, okay? Let's make this very clear. The word canon actually comes from a word that actually means rule, or like a ruler, almost like a measuring stick, a way of measuring things. But in this context, it means actually a list of books. So a Bible canon is a list of books in the Bible. Now we need to make it clear that a Bible is actually a collection of books. It's like a mini library. So a Bible canon, when we're talking about Bible canons, we're talking about the actual books that are in that Bible. There are different Bible canons. For example, the modern day Protestant Bible is different from the Catholic Bible. So the modern day Protestant Bible is a different Bible canon as opposed to the Roman Catholic Bible. Simply stated, the Protestant Bible has a different list of books than the Roman Catholic Bible has. And I should make it clear as well that when I say Bible canons, I'm not talking about a translation. Translations are different from canons. A canon is a list of certain books, and a translation is actually a translation of those certain books. So when I say different Bible canons, I'm not talking about, not talking about different Bible translations. The Bible as we know it today did not exist in the days when Jesus walked this earth in the flesh, okay? It did not exist in Bible days. The Bible didn't exist in Bible days, okay? If you read the book of Acts, the New Testament church doesn't say anything about a Bible because a Bible did not exist in those days. Instead, they had a library, okay? When you went to the synagogue, there was like a library of different books, different scrolls, actually. So you had the Torah over here. You had the Nevi'im, the prophets, over here. And each book was kept separately from one another. That's why it says when Jesus was in the synagogue, they called for the scroll of Isaiah to be brought to him. Not the Bible, the scroll of Isaiah. So there was the scroll of Isaiah, there was the scroll of Jeremiah. They were not together, they were kept separate. And by the way, Jesus had no problem with that. And so we must ask the question, how did the Bible start? Why did they begin with Bible canons if it wasn't like that to begin with? Who started it all? Well, you see, there was a man by the name of Martian, and he was a church leader back in the day, but he was considered to be a very evil church leader. Polycarp, one of the disciples of the apostle John, actually said that Martian was a child of the devil. Okay, he was considered to be a heretic. What Martian did was he took the Gospel of Luke and the letters of Paul and he put it all together in a canon and said this here is Holy Scripture and everything else is not to be considered to be Holy Scripture. You are to reject everything else, okay? Everything else except for the book of Luke and the letters of Paul. So what happened was the other church leaders, so they said, well, he did it. We should also do that as well. We're going to counteract this canon with our canon. And so that's how it started. 
And I'm gonna say something that nobody else actually said, and that is that the whole idea of Bible canons started off on the wrong note. It started off with the wrong foot. Now it's important to note as well that early Bibles had a different canon than what we have today. For example, the oldest Bible known to the world at this point is the Codex Sinaiticus. And that has a different canon than most Bibles today. Like for example, it includes books such as the Shepherd of Hermas and the Epistle of Barnabas in the New Testament. We don't see that today. So then how did we come to our canon today? And that question is actually a very loaded question because it was a long process of evolving. There were different church councils, there were different church leaders that said, well, we should read these books in the church, you know, as opposed to other books. And so over the centuries, the Bible canon has actually whittled down and it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. The more that time went on, the more books were actually cut out of the Bible and excluded. So right now we're actually left with a mess because we have many different Bible canons. We got many different Bibles, each one with their own canon. Again, don't forget, I'm not talking about translations, okay? Because those Bible canons have many translations as well. Depending on the church that that Bible comes from, it's got a different canon. We've got several different Orthodox churches, and each one of them have different canons. And it seems to be that the older the church is, the more books that is included in their canon. Consider, for example, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Now, that church has more books in its Bible than any other church on earth. It's a big church, by the way. It's like 40 to 50 million members. One day I was with a friend and he was, uh, he was driving me around and we were talking about the Word of God and he said, you know, the Bible is the Word of God. And I'm like, what Bible are you talking about? There are, there's so many different Bible canons. If you say that your particular Bible canon is the Word of God and not another Bible, that is from the church as well. I mean, the Christian church that goes by the Apostles' Creed just like any other Christian church would, and they have a list that's different than your list. So who's to say that your list is the right one and theirs is the wrong one? When you say the Bible, you need to realize that term is very broad. I mean, it means different things to different people. That's why you don't hear me using that term very much. I always say the scriptures instead of the Bible. And so to answer that question, which Bible canon does God approve? You need to realize a few things. Number one, that God is intelligent. He is the God of intelligence. He's not the God of stupidity. And being the God of intelligence, great intelligence, he wants you, as his child, to study and to learn. He doesn't want you to be overly simple or overly stupid. He wants you to be very educated. On the other hand, the devil operates by stupidity and foolishness, ignorance. Don't forget it says in the book of Acts that Jesus was crucified because of the ignorance of men. The ignorant men crucified him. If they knew, if they knew, they wouldn't have crucified him. The devil operates by stupidity. God brings intelligence and knowledge, whereas the devil brings stupidity and lack of knowledge. God wants you to study. God wants you to study scripture. God wants you to be educated in the history of the church, in the history of the faith. He wants you to be thoroughly knowledgeable of the books that are in your Bible and the books that are not in your Bible, but nevertheless were in first century culture. Look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, for example. They contain a lot of books that we don't have in our Bible. A lot of ultra-conservative evangelical Christians today would say to you that the Bible is the Word of God, that every single word of the Bible is God's Word for you today. But where do they get that from? How do they know that? 
The Bible doesn't claim that every single word in that Bible is the word of God. In fact, the Bible doesn't even claim to have the right canon. In other words, nowhere in history, no prophet, priest, or king ever said, God spoke to me and gave me a list. Nowhere in the Bible is it recorded that God spoke to any prophet saying to him, okay, you should take all these books, no more and no less than these books, and include it in a Bible canon. And this is the Bible canon, and this is Holy Scripture, and everything else is to be excluded. Nowhere, nowhere does it ever say that in the Bible. And for that reason, I say that the Bible itself is not biblical. <laughs> the Bible is not biblical. You know, some scholars would say, well, look at the Muratorian fragment. Look at that manuscript way back in the early centuries. And it's got a list of books that are to be included in the Bible. But you need to realize that the Muratorian fragment itself is not in the Bible. So to use the Muratorian fragment to prove that any extra biblical books are not to be read or trusted is self-canceling. To use the Muratorian fragment or any of the writings of the early church fathers to prove that, you know, the New Testament, you know, this is the canon of the New Testament. Everything else is to be rejected. Uh, it's like, wait a second, let me get this straight. You're using an extra biblical book, in other words, a book that's not in the Bible, to prove that extra biblical books are not to be trusted. Let's be honest here. Let's be honest. Canons, Bible canons have become idols. There is no perfect book, much less a perfect compilation of books such as a Bible canon. Bible publishers and certain church leaders whittled down the Bible canon over the centuries. They were in essence carving an idol, cut by cut, attempting to carve a perfect canon, a perfect holy Bible, especially in the Protestant world where they pretty much worship their canon as God, that it is absolutely perfect, perfecto. Any credible, knowledgeable scholar would tell you that a lot of these New Testament writings, at the very least, have grammatical errors. I mean, they are written by human beings that are prone to error. Now, am I saying not to believe in the scriptures? Absolutely not. I preach and I teach and I practice that the Bible should be believed. I'm talking about full faith in the scriptures. In fact, I have built my entire life around the Bible, in preaching the Bible, in teaching the Bible. So don't misunderstand me. I am not saying to doubt the Bible at all. I'm just saying that you should read the Bible with intelligence. You should be very knowledgeable and you should study thoroughly every book in your Bible and every book that's in other people's Bibles, such as even the Ethiopian Orthodox Bible and the Dead Sea Scrolls. You need to be educated. Remember, God is a God of intelligence. He wants his people to read each book individually. When Jesus was on this earth, there was no Bible and he didn't have a problem with it. He never gave any of his apostles any instructions saying, okay, this is it, okay, here's a list of books. You should take this list and make yourself a Bible. Put all of these books all together in one book and call it the Holy Bible. He never said such a thing. In fact, putting all these books together in one book is very confusing. It makes it look like they're all on the same level, and they're not. The Torah is on a different level than the prophets. The prophets are on a different level than the historical writings. The Torah is on a different level than the Gospels. And the Gospels are on a different level than the letters of Paul. And the letters of Paul are on a different level than the book of Revelation, and so on and so forth. Putting it all together in one book makes it very confusing. Each book of the Bible loses its individuality by doing so. Having a room full of the books of the Bible, each kept in its own separate location, is more conducive to proper biblical education. God wants you to look at each book of the Bible individually and ask, who is the author? When was it written? In what culture was it written? 
it makes a huge difference. For example, words that were used 50 years ago mean a whole lot different than they do today. How much more words that were used 2,000 years ago, we need to reclaim the individuality of each book. So putting all these books together in one book and call it the Holy Bible and you got so many different Bible canons, it's really doing a great disservice to the church. God is not into Bible canons. Now think about this just for a moment now. Taking the letters of Paul and putting them between the same two covers as the books of Moses is certainly not fair. It's just not fair. It really does a great disservice. God does not believe in Bible canons. He wants you to study and to read for yourself. You're going to run into people who say, well, you know, the Bible has been changed so much. You get, you know, that this gospel contradicts this gospel and this book contradicts this book and the different manuscripts contradict each other. And there's so many different variations in manuscripts. But here's the thing. The core message remains intact. Repent of your sins, meaning change the way you live, change the way you think. Jesus came. He died and he rose on the third day, and now he is waiting to come back again. The message remains the same. And if anybody cites the many different variations of the Bible to try to discredit the Bible, saying that you shouldn't believe the Bible because it contradicts each other here, consider this. Every major event in history has been reported with a lot of different variations. Consider, for example, the Titanic. There are people who were there, eyewitnesses. One eyewitness said the Titanic did not break in two. I saw it go down with my very eyes. Another eyewitness said, yes, it did. One eyewitness said, well, this was the last song that they played. Another eyewitness said, no, it wasn't. It was a different song. One eyewitness said, well, Captain Smith, this is what happened to him. Another eyewitness said, no, no, I saw it too. That's not how he died. And the reporters and the different reports of how many people died varied so much. I mean, even to this day, there is not really a concrete number of exactly how many people died on the Titanic. Does that mean that the whole entire account of the Titanic is to be thrown out? That you shouldn't believe any of it? Of course not. That's ridiculous. Because amongst all the different variations, they all agree on the same thing. The Titanic sunk. And any of you that have any kind of common sense whatsoever, you know that eyewitnesses, even eyewitnesses, have variations. Consider even court trials. Every trial has witnesses. And these witnesses, in spite of all claiming to be eyewitnesses, all vary in their testimonies. It's normal. In fact, if you were in a court trial and all of the witnesses said exactly the same thing, exactly the same thing word for word, uh, it's a, that makes it unbelievable. That raises a lot of questions. The variations among the witnesses make it more believable. In the same way, the variations in the scripture makes it even more believable. No scribe, no scribe in history ever claimed that God actually took their hand and forced them to write every single thing perfectly. No scribe in history. So to answer the question, what Bible canon does God approve? God's not into Bible canons. He's into intelligent study and education. Expect variations. Expect contradictions. But look at the common thread. Look at what God is saying in that scripture and obey it.